Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and welcome to this week's episode of The Knife Guy. So last week on Knife Guy, if you watched the episode, uh, I was talking about all of the crazy justifications we go through. You know, once we've seen the outrageous price tag on this thing that we saw a picture of that we, you know, we had to research. Oh my gosh, I have to have that. How much is it, right? And you see the price tag. And I talked about how, you know, that has a weird effect on us. And initially you turn away from it, then you come more, uh, you become more intrigued. You do more research. You try and find, um, you know, ways to fill these holes, uh, the holes being, you know, uh, like a, a way to kind of solidify uh, a part of the value. And you keep doing that until you can justify the whole price in some cases. And a lot of you guess, like, it sounds like he's, you know, it sounds like uh, he is trying to justify a watch purchase. <laughs> and you were right. Um, this is my new Formex Reef, and I absolutely love it. It's exactly what I uh, hoped that it would be. It's a uh, watch that has the appearance of a large watch, um, uh, but it, it wears like a just a more comfortable, leaner watch. Um, it just it has every element that I would want, and I'm so happy with it. And uh, it, but it was scary, right? Jumping off of that ledge, looking at that price tag, and going, "Oh my God, that's way more than I've ever spent." I don't even understand all the you know little things that I. I'm, all the little elements that would equate to the final price tag, right? So today I want to talk about the other end of that, right? And uh, I, that's why I wanted to show this. I don't know if you guys have seen the unboxing for this yet. It depends on how I, all of my content's pre-recorded. You, you might not actually see the unboxing until after today's Knife Guy episode, which is weird, but it happens sometimes. Um, but, uh, I wanted to make a point to say that I am very happy with this and it, it actually exceeded my expectations. Um, I'm, I'm just beside myself with happiness and I can't take the thing off my wrist, but, um, I want to talk about what happens on the other end of that. When you put something up on a pedestal, you build it up, you build the valuation up, right? And you think there's no way for me to handle this and take it on a test drive. It's not like I can go to a retail, a lot of this really expensive stuff. It's not like you can take it for a test drive, right? You can't go to like a Cabela's and handle, you know, an XM18 or whatever, right? Whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, you just kind of have to go, okay. And yeah, a lot of the stuff you can return, but some stuff it's kind of difficult, especially when you are, you know, um, interacting with people on the secondary market, right? You're on Blade Forums, you're on Reddit, you're on various uh, Facebook groups or Discord servers, right? And they're like, hey, listen, like once this is done, it's done. Some people are cool. Right? Shout out to those people who are cool and let people return it if it's not for them. There are cool people in the community who will let you do that. But oftentimes you'll deal with people who are like, look, once this is in your hands, it's yours. I'm not taking it back. Um, and, you know, to be fair, that's because people know how finicky and kind of uh, we kind of change our minds a lot you know in this enthusiast knife world right so it's just having dealt with so many different people that just have buyer's remorse right it's not that there's anything wrong with the thing that they sold it's just that they, they want the deal to be closed off so i kind of understand both sides of that but my point is um people like me and other reviewers other social media influencers right we build some of this stuff up to be really, really great. And I'd like to think that most of the time I'm pretty accurate. It's not guesswork, I'm judging based on my viewing audience's feedback. People telling me all the time, hey, you convinced me to buy this and I bought it and I'm so glad I did, etc. Every now and then I know that there's someone, you know, out there like, I finally got this thing and I don't really love it. <laughs> And sometimes people like me and other, you know, it's like for certain, I'm not saying everybody, but for some people, it, we make them afraid to speak up or say something online like, hey, this isn't for me. And I don't know if you've ever seen me respond to those people before, but I tell them most of the time, unless they're just being like, just unless they're just being nasty on, on purpose or if I, sometimes I don't believe that it's the, I think people are just like crapping on brands for no reason. But there are legitimately sometimes people who say, hey, I, I got this and I, I got to say, I just, I don't know. I, I, I don't think this is for me. I don't really like this or that. And when I can tell it's genuine, my response is always the same. It's, hey, it's okay. 
they're they're not for everybody. There's always going to be, I mean, no matter how much I like it, no matter how much other people like it, there's always going to be a few people who go, that's just, I don't really, I'm not feeling it, right? And that's okay. I know you don't need me to tell you that that's okay, but it is. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm the glass half full guy on YouTube, right? People come and watch my content. Like, he just thinks everything is great. He's always saying something nice about this or that. Well, number one, I mean, I can understand how you arrived at that conclusion. Number one, I really only like to look at stuff that I at least generally will have a few good things to say about. I don't like to show stuff that I don't think people will like because what's the point, right? You guys are watching my channel to figure out what you want to get next. I'm not just going to feed you a whole bunch of garbage that you're not going to want to look at. I try and pick and choose the things that I think are going to be good. Sometimes some crappy stuff squeezes through. And once I've got it, especially if I'm kind of offended on, you know, how the how it was marketed, I will actually do a negative review, right? But that's kind of besides the point. Um, what I was trying to say there is that there are definitely things that I get and think, hey, maybe this is going to be okay. Or maybe I'm, you know, this looks like something I'm really going to like. And then I get it and I go, ugh. No, no, I don't like this at all. Sometimes it's, I don't like it, but I think other people will like it, right? Lots of things that I've handled where I'm like, hey, the quality's there, but I'm not feeling the design for one reason or another. And I, what I want to do is come full circle and give you guys a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Yes, we will get all this stuff out here in just a little bit. Uh, this is a, a knife, and I still, because the, the video that I did is actually still generating a, a pretty good amount of views, and it's my top 50 greatest folding knife designs of all time. I tried to be real clear in the beginning and say, this is based on my opinion, and my opinion's not going to sync up with everybody, right? But the one knife that people were really, I had a few people like, how come a buck 110's not on here? How come the look? Right? Uh, all that was easy to dismiss because it was pretty isolated, but the one consistent comment I got on that video was, how could you not let a couple people go, <laughs> your credibility is shot and I'm unsubscribing. <laughs> Um, how could you not put the Sebenza 21 slash 31, whatever, the Sebenza on this list? How? That's like one of the, you know, most famous, most legendary folding knives of all time. You didn't put it on there, right? That's why in the beginning of the video, I tried to say, it's based on my opinion. <laughs> it's not, the video is not called top 50 most popular knives of all time based on community feedback. No. It was my own video, right? And I, I stand by that. And I, I know a lot of you guys watching this right now. You might be watching this video with your Sebenza in hand, feeling personally attacked. Um, I have had this opinion of the Sebenza since the beginning of the channel, since well before the beginning of the channel, and I stand by it now. It definitely is one of the most famous, one of the most iconic folding knives, right? Ever. It's been around for a long time. So many people hail it as the greatest folding knife of all time. The Sebenza has an incredible build quality, and it can definitely be used. And it can be used hard. It's a good tool. In fact, I think it's, uh, I think it's on point as far as the value, what you're getting, how capable it is, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like, yeah, it, it matches up. In fact, it's on my recommended knives playlist. But I don't like the design. I actually really dislike the design. I don't like the ergonomic lines. I don't like the thumb studs. The whole thing feels lackluster. For whatever reason, it's one of those knives that I feel like, even knowing dimensionally, being somebody that has handled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of knives that are north or south in price and quality, right? It just feels so much different than how it looks. It just doesn't, you know, it's that electricity that you feel the very first time when you get the thing, right? You get it. And how you imagine it, if it syncs up at least perfectly, or in some situations, a little bit better, then you like it. You love it, right? You kind of have this, you decide initially, do I like how it looks? Yes, right? Okay. Do I like the operation, the, the deployment mechanism, right? Do I, you know, can I map that out in my brain based on what I've handled? You're watching reviews. Like, this is this is me imitating you or myself watching reviews or reading, right? You read about the materials. You read about this. You read about different experiences people have, right? So you build it up in your head. You think you can kind of imagine what it feels like to break the detent or how the action's going to feel, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've, we've been there. 
Now imagine me, because at the point that I started to get intrigued about the Sabenza, I was well into the, I was, I had already had multiple hinderers. This was before the channel. Multiple hinders. I had had a Les George VECP V3. I'd had some Medfords. I'd, I'd had a bunch of stuff, right? The Sabenza was kind of the opposite of everything that I had handled. But I, I remember looking at it initially and going, that's a nice looking knife, right? You guys remember the first time you saw the Sabenza? Ooh, that's kind of crispy. That's kind of fancy. I kind of like that, right? You watch videos. Everything, everything that I heard about the Sabenza, it's so good. The action is hydraulic. It's not drop shut. It's not like this. It's not like this. It's its own thing. It's hydraulic, right? I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, hmm, yeah, okay. And then you look at the legacy of Chris Reeve. You look at the legacy of the Sabenza, right? You find out a lot of people on blade forms. Oh, man. If you've never been to Blade Forms, <laughs> if Blade Forms had a flagship knife, it would be the Sabenza, right? In fact, I'm not just zeroing in on Blade Forms. Like, it's like any online knife community, including my own, just hails the Sabenza. So I had every indication, everything pointing me. I was like, I've done my research. I've saved up, right? I can feel, I can feel really good about this because this is an American company, right? Now, it was actually on Blade Forms, and perhaps the person who helped me out with this years ago, I've not been in contact with them forever, but this was years ago. Um, I was asking questions about it in a, in a thread, and this person messaged me uh, and said, hey, uh, and, and I had had, you know how on Blade Forms it kind of ranks, or it gives you like, uh, it lets people know like how many good interactions you've had. Um, I, all of my, you know, uh, feedback was all clean, all thumbs up. I had 50 to 60 positive trades or reactions or whatever. And this guy messaged me and he said, Hey, uh, I've got one. It's fairly new. Uh, if you want, I can loan it to you. You can kind of test drive it and decide if it's for you. And I was like, Oh, wow. <laughs> Perfect. I was like, wow, cool. So I said, I'll, you know, I'll pay for shipping both ways. I'm trying to give details because if this person by some random chance is watching, that would just be so killer to find out. I said, I'll pay for shipping both ways. And he said, no, I'll pay for shipping to you. You pay for shipping back. And I said, okay. So he sent it and I was so excited to get that thing out. So, so excited to uh, just experience it for the first time, right? I remember getting it out and going, hmm, kind of. I opened the box. You know how like the Chris Reeve box, you open it up and there's a, just so much crap. <laughs> there's just, like the thing and the, there's a blue cloth and there's a little tool and there's a lube and there's a, all of that. And there's the knife sitting there, right? And I looked at it and I thought, huh, kind of, it's not glowing like I thought it would, right? And this is the, it's the case with a lot of stuff. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have watched my channel and you're like, why does it look so good on Metal Complex's channel? And I get it in person and it just looks like, Nyeh. like it's been sitting out in the sun too long, right? What's the deal with that? <laughs> the lighting. <laughs> the lighting on YouTube channels makes everything look really good, right? I'm not saying everybody experiences this with everything, but this is what I experienced with the Sabenza. I'm trying to relive it with you. So, so okay. So I dig in there and kind of pull it out. Um, and it's, you know, they, normally they have these wrapped, right? Like the, because I used to own an Um on. They like wrap them up. And the, but it was just kind of stuck down in there. And so I picked it up and held it. And that was the first underwhelming feeling, right? That was the first kind of like, mm. it's not like, it, you know, people are like, oh, it's because you like big knives and the Sabenza is not really all that big. no. That's not true. I have a, a much smaller knife that I carry on a regular basis, the tactile rock wall. Way smaller, right? So I do like big knives, but that wasn't it. There was just something about it initially. I'm going to use the rock wall because that's actually a better. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's, more, it's more along the lines of the Sabenza. And I turned it over and just looked at it and it just felt so soulless. Now, to be fair, I think part of what happened here is, uh, truthfully, I don't think the Sabenza was ever for me. 
But I think the real reason that I had such a negative response to it is because I built that thing up in my head infinitely. I watched nothing but positive reviews. I heard nothing but positive information, right? People describing these features in a way that was, you know, like they, they liked them. They had a, whether it was just, you know, post-purchase justification, right? Or whatever you want to call it, reaffirmation, right? That's That definitely exists sometimes. But I, I do believe that there are some people who just truly love every element of the Semenza, right? And it's not like I didn't like, you know, people say, oh, well, the action's not for everybody. Listen, my favorite Chris Reeve knife of all time is the Umnumzan, and it has essentially the same feeling of action. I will, I will own another one of those one day. Um, I don't know why I sold mine originally. But just turning the thing over and looking at it, I was just very unimpressed with the physical presence of the knife. I just didn't. The fit and finish was great. Everything was as, you know, as described uh, or what, you know, I realized I'm like, this isn't accurate. Just nobody was lying about the size or the weight or anything like that or the finish work. Like it's all there. It just didn't glow. I want it to be like I saw on the YouTube thing. Just be the glowing, shiny object that's worth 450. Back then it was 400 something. This was a 21 that I was handling. Um, and yes, I've handled and reviewed the 31. That's not it. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to deploy it. So this is where it really killed me. So I go to uh, deploy it and you guys, <laughs> those thumb studs. <laughs> it was like this. Nope. I hate it immediately right there. The blade was gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Everything fit and finish. Perfect frame, the bead blast, the contrast with the bead blast and the, you know, the legendary slightly reflective stone wash finish. In fact, it's one of my favorite finishes of all time on that knife, right? Those freaking just like, I don't know. Uh, you know, when, um, Super Mario three, when you go to, it's like world five and it's split between the lower area and then there's a cloud world and there's that castle that you have to go to and it takes you up to the clouds and you can see it on the map and it's this pink spirally thing that's real pointy at the top. That's what those thumb studs make me think of. That pink pointy spirally castle in Super Mario 3 for regular Nintendo that takes you to the sky world. It sucked. I And then I realized, I was like, I freaking hate everything about this. I, the, the ergonomic lines were, it's just basically like kind of a very not, um, it's, it's like a not super comfortable hourglass shape, like a very like gradually tapering. It's not an aggressive, like an actual hourglass. It's just, was just nothing, right? Again, quality there, solid lockup, good fit and finish, right? Obviously something that took, you know, a great deal of effort to, you know, to take from raw material form into knife form. But I was like, oh God, no, this isn't for me. I don't like it. I don't like any of this. So I sent it back and he said, what do you think? And I said, honestly, I hate it. <laughs> and he was like, oh, <laughs> I think he just didn't expect me to. And he was like, okay, well, he was cool about it. And I was like, I just don't like it. And it saved me the trouble, you know, because had I paid for it, would have been a slightly different experience. It would have been that initial, you know, same thing. I open it up, but my money's in it now, right? And you go through that weird, like, oh, yes, I see the, oh, oh the crown spine. And there's the, the, the hydraulic action. Oh, boy, that sure is nice. Mm, look at that. Oh, that uh, lanyard thing on there. Wow, look at that pocket clip. That sure is a good looking pocket clip, that there. Mm. And you do that because you're trying to, you're like, maybe if I just sit here and say enough nice things about it, I'm gonna love this thing that I just spent $400 on, right? <laughs> but then it just eats away at you. I've been there too, right? And it would have been a much longer, more frustrating experience as you sit there and torture yourself for a day or so or however you, however long you have 
in the return window, right? Some people, the people who like actively have to go out and use their knives, so you're really in a bad situation because you're not gonna sit there and decide whether or not you like it while you're flipping it on your couch. You're gonna have to take the thing out and use it before you decide whether or not it's for you. And guess what? As soon as you use it, for the most part, some knives, you know, the warranties aren't the same. As soon as you use it, it's yours, right? So you're rolling the dice. You're like, no, you know what? I just need to go out and use it. And then I'm going to love it, right? <laughs> for some people, that works, right? It wouldn't have made any difference for me. I judge things more on, like, for me, like, the difference between a knife that processes wood insanely efficiently versus a knife that processes wood kind of okay, right? That's kind of, I'm getting about the same amount of enjoyment out of it, right? There's a bunch of other enthusiast elements that, to, that I use. Those types of things are what I use to decide whether or not I love the thing and want to keep it, right? For, for some people, that's what it takes. You go out and use it and you go, oh, it's, this is a great tool, right? So there's people watching this video right now going, if you would take this Sabenza out and use it, you would love it. I'm telling you as somebody who's more of an enthusiast than someone who gets joy from the use of their knives, no, that's not going to make me like it. The knives that are used the hardest in my collection, I like them slightly more for their, you know, oh, I like this as a user. Like, it counts for almost nothing, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, to make another Elden Ring reference, like, stupid weapon requires 15 faith and I'm at 13. Stupid. So I got to waste two levels level ups to put two points into faith so I can use this stupid weapon, right? That's what, it, that's how I feel, right? That's how I feel. I, I use my knives. I like that, but that's not the main thing, right? For me, this is the corner that I exist in. So the Sebenza, which literally means work for anybody who didn't know, did not click with me at all. And to this day, it is still a knife that when people ask me like, hey, um, is the Sebenza a recommendable knife at the 400 or so price? Or I say, yes, but there are a bunch of other knives that I really like that I would choose first. If you're looking for value based on materials and execution, right? The Sebenza has this type of action, has this type of, you know, there, here's the factual information on the ergonomic lines, like how it's going to feel in your hand. Right? I try to give them that objectively and say, but consider this, 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 and this. And then I have all these different reasonings, just like you guys have seen on this channel for years. I have all these different reasonings and these different mindsets that I try to pour in and explain this is why I like this. The Sebenza, yeah, legacy, check, blah, 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 check, 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 check. This is why I didn't make the list because I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And there's nothing that's ever going to make me like it. <laughs> Just don't. I'm never going to have one in my collection. And to a lot of people, that's blasphemy, but... I'm not, I can't, you can't just fall in line, right? You're lying to yourself. There's a lot of people out there who probably are feeling like they're stuck with these expensive knives that they bought that people like me on the flip side of that said, yeah, these are great. There's, there's definitely a person out there, at least one person who bought a hinder knife because Metal Complex said it was great. And then they get in, they're like, I don't like this, but I feel like I'm supposed to because everybody else likes it, right? <laughs> You don't have to. I mean, you know, if you're outside of the warranty or you've used it, then you're kind of stuck with whatever the resale value of it is, right? But that's it's important to identify that moment for yourself because it's not really about anybody else, what anybody else thinks, right? If literally every single person in the entire world loves this, loved this Abenza, which is how it feels, and I was the only person who didn't like it, I'm not going to change my mind. I'm going to go, well, sorry, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how I feel, right? But I don't want to, again, I don't want to rain down on Chris Reeve knives because I like their, like their, again, I try to keep saying, their quality is excellent and I love the Umnumzan. I think that is one of the 50 greatest knife designs ever, right? That one clicked with me. Not just because it's bigger and more robust, it just, the design made more sense to me, right? It felt better. That connection from looking at it through a, rectangular internet window and actually getting it out and holding it. Look, I was like, yeah, this feels like how I thought it would, right? <laughs> but it's important to identify that and be honest with yourself and say, is this really that great? Or am I just like gritting my teeth and going, oh, I'm part of it. I'm, I'm part of the game, guys. I got the thing that the guy told me to buy. Identify it for yourself, right? Pick and choose the parts of these videos, not just with my content, but with everybody's content. You pick and choose the parts that make sense to you, right? 
Now, a lot of this, it's like, well, I can't, all I can do is judge based on whatever people, other people are saying, because I, I can't test drive this stuff. So I got to get it. When you get this stuff, if you pay a bunch of money for it and you get it and you're not feeling it, you know, give it a chance. Don't void the warranty or the return policy or anything like that. Give it a little bit, but then be honest with yourself and go, is this what I expected it to be? And if it's not, okay, then return it, you know? Take, spend your money on something you're going to like, not what everybody else seems to like, right? There's always going to be the more or less popular, but you might not be like everybody else, right? There's lots of stuff out there that I think is absolutely absurd and terrible and ridiculous that might bring somebody else an infinite amount of, an infinite amount of joy. And that's fine because it's really, for that person, it's not about anybody else. It's about them and that thing, right? It's just, that's what they want. So yeah, Formex Reef, absolutely love it. No, <laughs> no buyer's remorse whatsoever. This is hands down the nicest watch I have ever owned. But there was a little bit of fear before it got to me. What if? What if the Formex Reef is not the ultimate watch or just what I expect it to be, right? I had tried really hard to look and compare Right, every little thing. I went over the, you know, I went over the details uh, of like watches that I had come to love. And I'm like, what makes me love this? What specifically do I love about this? And then I would compare with the Formex and think, what's different, right? Do I like this more or less aesthetically on the Formex? What's going to be different about the Formex versus, in this case, the Seiko Samurai, right? And is that going to bother me? And uh, I was, you know, so happy to find out that every last little Thing, every last difference was properly mapped out. And when I got the thing out, it was truly what I wanted. It was truly what I expected it to be. And I, I'm very happy. But, you know, I had to accept that there was a chance that the reality would not be that. The reality would be that I'd get it out and go, why? <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that that wasn't the case. So but it can happen and it will continue to happen. You know, that's, I'm going to, eventually I'm going to buy something. I'm going to spend a whole bunch of money on something and it's going to get to me and I'm going to go, yikes, I hate it. I don't just kind of dislike it. I, 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 I hate it, you know? So anyways, what do we got on the table today? We have the very rare titanium ProTech SNG. We have the Hinderer XM24 Dark Horse. That's not actually the official Hinder name. I just named it that. We have the uh, UTX-85 or the UTX-85-2, which is essentially the same thing as the UTX-85-1. Tactile Turn Bolt Action Pen, wonderful pen. Civivi Conspirator, wonderful model from Civivi. The uh, Civivi Altus, also a wonderful model from Civivi. We have the uh, Pena X-Series Texas Trapper, uh, Cranes Cutlery Exclusive in Damasteel and Fat Carbon. We have the Tactile... Knife Co. Rockwall. Running out of room here. We have the Victorinox Swiss Tool Spirit MX, which is a wonderful multi tool. We have the um, Vero Engineering Synapse XL. I'm just going to close that back up. <laughs> uh, we have the Chavez 229, uh, made by Riot. We have the um, Microtech and Reich. Uh, SOCOM Bravo. We have the uh, Good Screw uh, Company Timascus Driver. I can't remember if there's an actual name for this, but the Good Screw Company is amazing. Those are great drivers. And then we have this. I know people, anybody who didn't see my unboxing of this are like, what the heck is that? We have the PMP Alpha Beast, which, yes, you actually can. <laughs> you ready? Flip it out. <laughs> <laughs> the PMP Alpha Beast, which is the thickest, um, I have to say this every time, uh, is it thicker than a Medford? It's so much thicker than the biggest knife that Medford makes. Like, you have no idea. The biggest, thickest knife that Medford makes does not hold a candle to this at all. Uh, 0.4 inches. 0.4 or 10 millimeters <laughs> on the blade stock. No longer available. These were pre-order uh, only a few months ago, and I think they're all sold out. But the PMP Alpha Beast, monstrous. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. This is a long episode of The Knife Guy. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode or um, you know, found it entertaining or relatable in some way, shape, or form. 
Uh, please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you did enjoy this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives. They're either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.